this is the second time I'm doing this talk. I did um, I did a first iteration of it at Nordic APIs in Stockholm. It's um, it's a continuation of some of the thinking that we've been doing around internal developer portals and around how to um, like how to really scale API documentation, how to go from only a few APIs to like tens or even hundreds of APIs, uh, how to do that in a way that um, it's it's not just working from a publishing perspective, but also thinking about um, a potential strategy for um, for scaling your infrastructure and your authoring process. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit because this is, I think, true success for uh, an API program is not only about making great APIs, it's not only about documenting well, um, it's not only about you know being successful with your customers, it's also about being strategic and um, figuring a way out to make a, a, a big enough impact with your API program. So and, um, the second part of this talk will be about that. Uh, and there's some new, new ideas that I've been working on around uh, digital transformation and the role of APIs in digital transformation. Um, it's still early days. Um, would love, I would really love your feedback. So we'll have a bit of time at the end of the, um, the hour um, to, to just talk a little bit about these ideas and, and see what you think about it because I'm using them to build, um, to put together a, a digital transformation workshop. Okay, so um, uh, very short, um, we're Pronovix. Uh, we're a, a company specialized in developer portals. As far as we know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as we know, we're the only consultancy that is fully dedicated to developer portals uh, in the world. Um, there's um, a lot of agencies, web agencies, that will build your dev portal if you ask them to. There's um, a lot of um, API management companies that will um, sell you a dev portal or maybe build you a dev portal. Um, but most, like as far as we know, there's there's um, like it's an organization that's fully dedicated um, to dev portals only and developer experience. Um, I, I, I haven't heard of anybody else so far. Um, we've done a lot of work in a bunch of different industries. Um, uh, these are all dev portals that we've built in these different industries um, for some of the largest companies in the world. We've also worked on Apogee's, uh, which is now part, part of Apogee, which is now part of Google, um, on their uh, developer portal integration for Drupal. Um, and um, we won uh, an award for our dev portal that we built for ABN AMRO a little while ago. Um, and then we've, um, we, like, we, we also built our own award. So I'll have a slide about that in a moment. Um, we do a lot of research and a lot of talks uh, like this one in a bunch of different communities to, to um, share knowledge between different communities and to cross pollinate uh, communities. And um, yeah, and, and as I said earlier, we, we also have like the Dev Portal Awards, which is an award that we organize about developer portals and developer experience and API documentation specifically, um, and the API to Docs conference series that we organize. So, but what is this talk about? Um, if you've seen any of my previous talks or um, any of our webinars, you've probably already realize that developer experience can be a lot of work. <laughs> and um, uh, like I, I won't go into detail into all of these different types of documentation, but there's a lot of different types of documentation that you need to get like the full all around experience for uh, a, a good developer portal and to, to really help um, your uh, develop, you, you, your um, consuming uh, developers like the people that are building integrations with your API um, to help them no matter where they are in the developer journey and uh, and it can be a lot of work so and uh, what we've seen is that uh, when you that that can work if you have a dedicated team uh, on a smaller scale so like if you only have a few APIs but then once you start really scaling up like some of our customers have hundreds of APIs um, things get tricky because it's just too much work. So and, um, what I want to uh, talk in this presentation uh, about is a couple of 
um, like one clear strategy for doing for addressing this this um, problem, and then also uh, the thing I talked about earlier. Um, how are we doing so far? Can you all hear me okay? Um, yeah. Any questions so far? Okay. Then. Um, So I think the biggest problem with uh, dev portals uh, is probably, like especially if you have hundreds of APIs, is probably the issue of findability and discoverability, uh, especially internally. If you have um, a large enterprise organization with lots of different departments um, and people have been building APIs uh, for their own departments, and you, you want to try to make it possible for people to use um, these APIs across the organization, um, findability and discoverability are a really huge issue. I've talked with um, several organizations where, like the, the typical problems I hear when I talk about this is, uh, yes, we have this uh, API or this service listing page, um, but, you need to fulfill certain requirements and until you fulfill those requirements you can't be listed so actually uh, um, x percent of our organization's services are not on that page or you know yeah a couple of years ago we started doing this but it's kind of forgotten and we don't really do it anymore or uh, yeah we only can list uh, apis from like this technology with that gateway or something so there's there's um there's a bunch of reasons why typically uh, these lists are not complete and that uh, causes problems with just you know discoverability um, another really big issue that I've, I've, I've seen in several places is that the um, uh, capabilities of that uh, api listing on the, of that service listing are just not good enough um, like one organization i've seen they just had an alphabetical list of services which meant that some of the teams in the organization started titling their APIs, underscore, underscore, capital A, 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 you know, my actual name of my service, uh, just so that they would be at the top of the list. So and stuff like that, um, you know, it, 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 it's really bad. Um, and then the, the, the other thing is, um, like when, when you combine that with wild growth of services, like lots of people creating more and more APIs, um, where there might be the same kind of purpose being served by multiple APIs and you don't really know which one is good and which one is bad. Um, wild growth of, of, doc of documentation where there's nobody managing the information that's available. Um, like you just have um, a giant confluence, pay, um, confluence wiki where everybody just keeps adding more and more content. Uh, and uh, missing technical writers who can help make sense of all of this, then you you know you really quickly get into um, some serious issues. Um, so uh, how do you, how can you address this? Now, there's one of the key issues that we've seen uh, when we start talking with um, um, organizations on top of this issue of just pure findability and discoverability is also that there's different audiences that you're trying to serve. You have both technical and business audiences that are both authoring and consuming this information. And um, so these, these are four use cases for your developer portal. And what we see often is that the business needs are completely ignored. Um, there's um, the authoring experience. There's just no authoring experience for business people. There's um, there's also you know this is a developer thing, so it's really geared to developers, and there's no really there's not too much thought into you know how are we going to make it easier for business people to find out what they need to know. And um, so the way that we've been addressing this in in our developer portals is by providing two types of authoring experiences. One which is CMS based. Um, using, in our case, we use the Drupal CMS, uh, where we have these landing pages that are geared towards business audiences or, or towards helping people to self-select what user journey they need to be able to find the information they need. Um, 
and um, that can be um, that, that can be altered in the CMS uh, just using the, the graphical interface uh, authoring interface for for pages and then we have uh, CICD for docs where we do um, docs as code where we store information in the code repository together with uh, the code and then deploy that into the CMS using a CICD process um, the cool thing about this is that uh, you you don't need to have all the information in one place. You can like assemble it from across the organization uh, in, into your publishing interface. So the the way that we you know and and um, it means that you can have uh, different repositories. So even if you have a heterogeneous technology um, uh, landscape with different teams using different tools, um, they can still uh, push content into the publishing tool, into the CMS, um, uh, even with automated jobs um, from the code repository where they're managing the content. Um, what we've what we've seen success or what we've seen uh, succeed to scale uh, API documentation is to take this approach and to have different chunks of information. So you have your API documentation, you have your reference spec. Uh, like open API spec or, or you know the swagger file or um, and the markdown file with a description of your um, service and JSON um, a JSON file with metadata about the service and you bring all of these pieces of content together into um, a single content model uh, for APIs that then allows you to have for every single API you have the same kind of information and then some of those APIs could be um, could be REST API, some of those could be even SOAP, or you know whatever else you have. Um, but you have like a, a standard way of doing this that allows you to create uh, the metadata uh, that will be searchable through the through like a facet search interface. And then you get something like what uh, if you if you um, like look at DHL's page, uh, they have a, a, a really nice set of facets where you can like drill down and say like, okay, I only want services um, uh, for rate, like rating services from the DHL e-commerce uh, division. And you can like drill down in like lots and lots of APIs and find the one that you're actually looking for. Um, then now, but that's not enough because that's just um, lots of APIs. What you then need on top of that is um, a set of landing pages that help you self-select where you need to go. And also a set of landing pages, probably um, like Cristiano Beta calls these uh, building blocks, which are APIs that you typically work to uh, use together to achieve a certain function. And you describe those together and you explain them together uh, through either documentation pages or through landing pages um, that are like either more marketing, a little bit more marketing-y or more um, technical oriented. Uh, and then you you get like what well, you you can see this uh, on TomTom sites. They've they've done a really good job uh, in building very rich information architecture to help people self-select. You know what what their goals are, and then you can like figure out like for example, if you need to build an application that's going to use a tracking API, then you can like zoom in and and dive deeper into the specifics uh, for uh, tracking APIs or you know for traffic or things like that. Um, now, one issue that I've seen, and I think this is also a scaling issue, is like how do you manage the the hierarchy of those nodes? So, like if you have uh, different, so with the landing pages, that's one thing, but uh, probably you're managing those in the CMS. But for example, if you have multiple Markdown files that you want to um, bring together in a hierarchy. Of, um, of like a content hierarchy uh, that people can then explore. Um, there's currently three models that we are aware of that you can use to organize your content. One is to use, uh, this is what most static site generators use, is to use the folder structure of the repository to organize content. The second one is to use um, a manifest file and the third one is to use uh, like the CMS like just basically to restructure information in the in the place where you're publishing from um, 
I think that if we're thinking about scalability, I think that the manifest file is probably the only way that you can you can do it really well in a composable manner, so that you can have multiple manifest files that list um, the relationships between different pieces of content, uh, so that you can like bring those together into the site and have like different outlines with content that uh, together forms the, the overall hierarchical structure of the site. Um, you can also version the manifest file and, and keep track of changes. I know that this is not the most popular strategy right now in the in the static site generating static site generator world and i think this is probably because most static site generators are being used by small very cohesive teams that are able to set um of standard operation procedures uh just in the team uh, so they can they can put their constraints in people rather than in the tool and uh, which gives them more flexibility and allows them to do you know to be more uh, like iterate quicker and, and do things more rapidly but it also is a limitation especially if you have like a large organization where you have multiple departments that need to work together on uh, their content and i think that's why i i believe that manifest files are a better way forward um, in the technical writing world this has been done by different standards like in the data world the data map is um, is one approach uh, we're currently investigating if we can use the uh, the, the lightweight data map um, standard as as a, a standard for for the format for um, a standard format for organizing markdown files because that's that's something that's as far as i know is not really available at the moment or there's no no clear idea about you know how to do that in a consistent manner um, ASCII doc and restructured text as far as I know already have this built in um, but because most of our customers are using markdown uh, I think this is this is an area that, that still needs uh, work if you're interested in this make sure you're on our mailing list we'll be um, like I'm talking with a few people from the DITA community about doing a blog post series around this topic okay um, maybe another good point to ask uh, if there's any questions so far or any comments Um, can you give a short overview on how open API specs MD and JSON can be used together to leverage the content for API docs? Um, so uh, let me just yeah, so basically what we've seen um, so the open API spec uh, so a lot of people see the open API spec as the full documentation that you need for an API. And I've seen a lot of people say like, well, you know, you can just put uh, in, in the, the markdown section that you have in the spec, uh, you can just put your tutorials and whatever other content you need to put. And, um, but I, like I've seen in some cases that this results in these really, really long specifications that are not very usable and also, um, these are like things like tutorials need at a different time in the developer journey. Uh, you don't need tutorials like when you're doing your development. Um, you're probably not really following um, a step-by-step -step tutorial anymore. Like that's more like when you're figuring out how to do an integration, and uh, like when you're in the troubleshooting phase, uh, you you don't want that anymore. You want you want just just uh, the reference documentation and and any concepts that you might need for that. So it's like the ability to have more granular content can, can be important. So what we've done uh, with one of our customers, uh, they uh, had um, they had open API spec files for, for the REST APIs. Uh, they had JSON files where they had things like, you know, what department is this API from? What, um, what industry, what, uh, what functional domain, or th things like this, like the metadata that helped to describe the API they had in a JSON file. Uh, and then they had a markdown file with this description, like the business language about the API. So what we did in the, the Drupal CMS is uh, import all of these pieces into one single API entity. 
uh, so that all that information was uh, in a structured way available in, in the Drupal CMS. And then we could use that to do the faceted search uh, and, um, yeah, and to expose different aspects of the information in different places. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, yep. Other questions? Okay, then I'll continue. Um, so now, um, this is the strategy that we've seen uh, succeed for, for scaling API documentation. Now here comes the hardest part is um, we had our API to docs conference in Amsterdam a couple of weeks ago. And during the on conference, um, we actually, we had a session where several people from large companies, large enterprise companies came to me and said, okay, um, this is all great, but like we have this problem, which is how do we get our different divisions to help us fund this initiative? Because we, we got some money, we got some money from uh, central IT uh, or like, you know, from the business. Um, but in two years from now, we need to be self-sufficient and we need to be able to uh, re reverse bill our different departments. Um, so we need to somehow convince them that this, they need to service, that they need a developer portal, that they need API management. And we need to, um, yeah, we need to somehow kickstart this program so that we're making enough money um, from like, you know, that, that we're creating enough value so that we can keep on paying for the services that we need to be able to you know, run an API management program or, or run a developer portal. And um, and like it, it it's uh, it kind of ties into some of the things that I've been noticing a little while ago, where uh, I was seeing. So we have some customers that are really really rocking it. They are doing really really well with their API program. Uh, that have um, like where APIs have become a core of the business that um, they represent. Uh, and then we have also customers where they've done initial API and they're still kind of in this um, twilight zone where they're they're seeing some initial successes, but it's not like it's like the massive transformation that's changing the business forever. And that's like really having a significant impact on the business. Um, and I think um, as I was thinking about this, because one of my core goals of um, specializing our business in developer portals was that I wanted to be able to go along with our customers to help them become really successful with what we're doing, not just build whatever they ask us to do, but to, to really to go beyond that and um, to, to help them be successful as a business rather than just, you know, have a nice website. Uh, and, and, um, the, the tricky thing there is that um, to really understand the business, to really be able to help organizations with this, you have to almost work at the business because um, there's so much contextual information that you need. Um, it's, it's a, you, you can't come in like, hey, I'm the expert. I'm going to tell you how to run your business. That doesn't work. Um, so I've been thinking about a lot about what, what is it exactly that we're trying to do? What is digital transformation really about? And this is, this is what uh, the second part is going to be about. So how do you become really successful with APIs? And I think the key thing is that, um, and this has been a big progress, but the key thing is that um, we've moved from just APIs as like a technology thing to APIs as a product, as a, where API management and developer portals are like a product platform for your business. And thinking about APIs as product is really crucial. But I believe now that it is not enough, that if you really wanna become a, um, a key player in the digitally transformed world, that you need more than that. I think that if you really wanna become a key player, um, then you need to become a, a, an affordance platform. You need to become um, a platform that where you're taking your internal capabilities and you turn them into APIs 
that are uh, capabilities that are acting as affordances to other people, uh, uh, where you can build platforms on top so that other people can use the uh, capabilities that you have in-house um, for, for their own purposes. And this is a significant difference. There's a significant difference between API products and API uh, productized affordances. An API product is your you're going to your customer and saying like, okay, customer, I'm trying to build a product for you. Like, can we figure out like, what is something that you need? And with an affordance product, you're saying, okay, well, we have like what Amazon did, for example, we, we have, a, um, we need a lot of hosting services. So we built this internal capability to host websites. And now we're gonna turn it into an, out, an affordance that we share with the world and we turn it into a platform where other people can use our hosting service. Or um, or also another Amazon example, we have a delivery service for our, our products. Um, and actually that's an interesting product that we can turn into a productized affordance that other people can use to deliver whatever else they want to, to deliver. And um, so it's that, that um, yes, looking for products and building digital products is great and it's a really really important step it's much better than just building apis um, but but i think if you really want to become one of the key players in the market then you need to go one step further and you need to become a platform and to become a successful platform i think you need to to um, one of the easiest or one of the most successful ways to do that is to take your internal affordances and turn them inside out and turn them into um, the, the capabilities that you share with, with others in your platforms. But I'll explain a little bit more in, in the next slide. So as I said already, like for me, and I, you know, I think that's, that's kind of like a given is that, that APIs are about digital transformation, but digital transformation is not only about APIs. Uh, I think I've been doing a lot of research and thinking about this. Uh, I think that, um, Digital transformation has a lot to do with a lot of other transformations that are happening uh, today. So um, this is a slide that I made for a talk I did at, um, was that the OSCOM? No, I think this one was at um, InterSourcing Summit. And um, it, it was this, I, I found this, this picture is from Forbes, uh, where they talked about what they called the Copernican revolution in management. It's this idea that we're moving from um, organizations that are fully centered around uh, their processes and their processes only towards organizations that are more centered around uh, people, where people are in the center, kind of like, you know, the sun is in the center, that kind of thing. Um, and that, uh, you know, businesses are becoming more human. I love the message of that, but I think that actually that is not the reason why this is happening. I don't think this is because business suddenly started caring about people. Um, I think that it's more, it has more to do with this, this story. Just want to drink a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> for the last 100, 150 years, uh, since, since the industrial revolution, We've been building our organizations and uh, our communities more and more like machines. Um, we, we figured out this way of building things that was hyper efficient um, by streamlining uh, our processes, by creating these perfect machines that you could just, you know, that run like clockwork, uh, you know, we even, even call it like that. And the, the idea was that um, uh, systems, um, if you had a sufficiently advanced expert, they could design and fully understand systems that would do one job like really, really well. And this, this is also how we, how most of our software engineering works uh, even until today. And this, this was brilliant because it was super, super efficient. And, um, and like the gains that we've gotten from that, like mass production and, and the, the wealth that we, we enjoy today, especially in the West, is a, is a direct result of, of this transformation. 
and, and it was it was amazing uh, because it, it 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 gave us um, a lot of wealth collectively. Um, it it's created a lot of power for for everybody. It democratized uh, wealth. Now the problem is that um, the systems are hyper efficient as long as the conditions remain the same. If you drop this watch, if you uh, if you have a car, like a car is another of those systems. If you have a car. Uh, a car will run really, really smoothly until you remove one single piece from the engine or until you have like lots and lots of potholes in the road. And so when when um, there's disturbances in the environment, when the starting conditions are no longer the same and constant, then suddenly complicated systems stop working. And then and then the, the only way to really address those uh, ever-changing environments is uh, through complex systems. So there's, there's um, I think that what's going on today is this move from complicated systems to complex uh, systems, where we need to change our organizations from machines into uh, ecosystems, into uh, systems where lots of people are interacting with each other in uh, you know structured way. Uh, the reason why that uh, is necessary, I think, is because um, through digital to digital technology, we've increased the connectivity of the world. Uh, right now, um, like it used to be so that uh, people were connected to maybe say 150, 200 people, uh, and, and it was always geographically bound. So you were connected to the people around you. And um, there were super, a few super connectors that were doing more traveling, but for the most part, people were mostly connected to the people around them. And the world was a lot less complex because um, the, there were just not, not as much connections. Today, however, uh, anybody can be connected to potentially billions of people um, through the internet. Um, our reach has increased a lot and our networkedness, the state of our network has increased massively, exponentially. And because of that, um, these complicated systems um, no longer work because uh, there's so much more changes happening in, in the world around us that um, a, a small change in China can have a massive effect on your business today here in, in Europe. And um, these machines can't, like these complicated systems, can't adapt fast enough. By the time uh, um, an expert can come in and architect a perfect system, everything has changed again and it's no longer valid what, what uh, you were trying to optimize for. So I think that most enterprise companies today have built uh, are, are have grown like trees. They're still adaptive. Um, they're they're really adaptive as they grow. They're still somewhat adaptive. Like if you cut off a branch, the branches will emerge. But they're overall they're quite rigid uh, as as they mature. And I think what we need to do is to become more like an ant nest that's a lot more adaptive. That can be um, you know you can transplant an, an ant nest and. If, as long as the queen is there and there's enough workers, um, they'll they just start a new nest. And I think what what that means practically for businesses is that from going from value flows where there's a single optimized flow, we're moving towards value networks where multiple nodes are connected to each other um, through, uh, through through some ways. Um, and and also that this this shift from kind of like this. Um, very strictly hierarchical organization that's more like an oil tanker. You know, it takes us a year and a half to buy any product, or it takes us two years to buy a product, uh, and we need to jump through all these hoops and get all these approvals to an organization that's uh, learning much, much faster, that has a much larger surface with um, the, their customers, more like a, 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 like a beehive or something like that. But how do you do this? How do you how do you restructure your business? And I think um, there's a few patterns uh, that we can look at. Now I'm I'm still working on this. Uh, I'm still um, trying to build a framework that I can I can use with organizations to start looking at like okay how do we restructure this? Where are the boundaries? Um, uh, and and you know to provide a framework to think about it. But I think a really useful framework is um, a stick merge. Uh, what you're seeing here on, on the, the GIF is uh, ants that are coming back to their nest with food. 
that are putting down a pheromone trail. So the more food there, there is in a certain direction, the more pheromones are, putting down, are being put down, the more ants will follow that exact trail uh, to the food source. And um, so what they're doing is that, in, like while individual ants are pretty stupid, uh, as a group, they show behavior uh, by uh, changing their environments that, that creates really complex uh, possibilities where you have emergent intelligence of uh, this, the, the group that is much, much higher than the intelligence of any individual ant. And it's, um, it's a way that uh, complex adaptive behavior uh, emerges from a group of individuals that are you know, doing their own thing. So I think this comes to another way of looking at complexity. As I talked earlier about um, complicated versus complex, and like complex, often we, we look at it as something bad, but complexity can actually be something good. Um, complexity uh, in, in a group, in an, in an organization, can be a means to address changes in the outside, is by um, by readjusting and restructuring themselves inside, they're able to adapt and to deal with whatever the environment is throwing at them. Uh, so, and actually, um, complexity in ecosystems and in uh, systems provides for a much more robust and lots more um, adaptive uh, system that can deal with, you know, you can kill um, like a lot of, uh, the species, and um, you can kill a lot of the members of a certain species in an ecosystem, an ecosystem will still stand uh, because it just keeps re rebalancing and restructuring. Like there's some point where that breaks and that it no longer uh, can adjust, but it's much less brittle than a system that's um, that's like optimized for one specific purpose. In a way, um, I got this from a book, and I'll I'll put the title up at the end of my slides. Um, I got this from a book uh, that's called uh, Understanding Complexity. It's, um, it's an audiobook um, on Audible um, that talks about like a lot of different interesting concepts around complexity. Um, but the thing that, that I thought was really, really exciting is that um, you can tune the complexity of a system by adjusting these four parameters, uh, by adjusting the interconnectedness, like how many um, connections do individual agents in the system have with each other? Interdependence between agents, like how well are they reacting to each other? Diversity of the agents and uh, adaptivity of the agents. So um, now if you look at your organization, you can start thinking about how can we increase our internal complexity um, by tuning these parameters. And I think that I, I have an assumption um, or a hypothesis that uh, a developer portal that is a, a tool for communicating about services in your organization that is also a communication tool that helps connect different parts of your organization uh, like you know the developers from different parts of the organization that might help you um, signal adaptivity um, that might help you increase interconnectivity um, and interdependence uh, it i think that this could be a tool to help uh, drive, increase the complexity, uh, like, you know, good complex adaptiveness of, uh, of your organization by not just doing APIs, but also looking at uh, inner sourcing of uh, software projects uh, by training developers, by uh, creating a community for your developers and, and things like that. Um, and I think that like um, one of this hypothesis that I'm going to be testing with some of our customers in, in the next year, or, or next years is like, can we use the dev portal as a tool to manage the complex adaptiveness? Because those far, four parameters I was talking about, if they're too low, if there's too little connectivity, then we don't have complex adaptiveness. If there's too much connectivity, if everybody's connected to everybody, uh, you also don't get complex adaptiveness. So the the you know you need to be somewhere in the middle for all four of those parameters to get uh, good behavior. And and I I. I think that uh, Dev Portal could be a good place to start tweaking this um, and to start helping to, to transform your culture uh, so that you can become a complex adaptive organization. And then um, affordance platforms, just gonna do a time check. 
Um, so for these platforms, yeah, I'm a bioengineer by education. Uh, I'm, 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 this is maybe a little bit far from, from API world, but there's some really interesting things in biology uh, that I think are relevant for what we're doing in our industry. In that, um, about in biology, it's often about um, boundaries and signals. And uh, boundaries and signals is how complex adaptive behavior emerges. Um, and it's about like where do you put your boundary and how do you do that in the right way. Also, in biological systems, we have these hyper constraints pieces that are a little bit like our factories, um, like the mitochondria. Uh, there are energy factories that by being hyper constrained allow the rest of the cell to be hyper adaptive and to have lots of capabilities to adjust itself to the environment that it's living in um, and it's um, by by having these machines in inside of our organizations so like having some parts that are hyper constraints some parts that are much less constrained where there's a lot more freedom and adaptivity that we can combine um, a much more efficient energy production or much more efficient value production with a much better adaptivity that allows us to adjust ourselves to whatever is happening on, on the outside. And one particularly interesting things that, thing that um, like most um, eukaryotic, so most multicellular organisms are doing is, is uh, is platform creation. So like if you look in the intestines, um, that's the, the picture on the top, uh, you have all these, like there's this massive surface where lots and lots of bacteria can live. Um, if you look in trees, if you look at the root system, you see that they built these symbiotic relationships with fungi and and, um, and bacteria. So basically what we do as, as um, eukaryotic organisms is we use our surplus and energy to create niches for other organisms to to help to to uh, complement us and to help us ad adjust to different environments. For example, um, a human that has the right bacteria can eat foods that a human with different bacteria can't. So, like you can adjust uh, the the bacteria that you have. You can adjust your pla your platform participants to help you adjust to different environments. So, and here it comes back to this um, looking at like what are the platforms that you can build from the capabilities that you need to survive yourself. So like looking at what your capabilities are that you have today as an organization and then uh, turning those into um, productized affordances uh, through APIs that allow other people to use uh, those capabilities uh, or other organizations to use those capabilities um, that can help to complement you and that help you uh, adjust to different environments uh, and to learn from the environment and to really quickly adapt and to maybe absorb even some of the learning that's being done in your different um, communities. So you can like grow a, a massive surface of, of um, markets, uh, of platform markets that teach you about what's going on in the world and how can you become more and more efficient, efficient and effective, uh, uh, more and more effective, uh, rather than just efficient? Uh, and then you know, finding the right balance with having enough um, uh, areas where you're happy, efficient, where you're, you're making a lot of money that help you to do that uh, is how you get these hyper growth uh, engines like uh, the Fangs, like the the Google, the the Googles and the Amazons of this world, um, where um, now. The last part of all of this is like, what is this? Um, what, how do you cut this extra energy? And here I get this idea um, that I got from Thomas uh, Siebel's book about digital transformation. And he talks about data as oxygen, as a, a, a fuel that is lethal to the unadopted, that is causing a great extinction in the business world, like you know, businesses that can't adapt to the rise of data, um, they're, they're dying. Um, but the ones that can adapt, they get this new super hyper efficient fuel that allows them to become much more efficient than, than all their, their competitors. And I think that um, like data is this natural monopoly 
that um, gives affordance platforms like Google and Amazon the energy to build multiple market platforms. Does that mean that we all have to go into consumer data and start selling that? No, definitely not. Um, like there's, um, you know, I, I'm going to leave the ethical implications uh, open here. Uh, but there's there's uh, other data platforms that you can build, like the way that, uh, for example, TomTom is doing this. Um, they have their data store about traffic and um, geography that they've built a bunch of services on top that are feeding back into the system to learn more about traffic and uh, geography to improve the services that they're providing to their uh, platform participants. So it's this virtuous circle where you're generating new data that is helping you to improve your services, that is helping you to generate more data, that's helping you to improve your services. So if you can build uh, a data engine like that um, uh, with uh, APIs that allow you to increase your market surface and your, your learning surface, then you can, um, you can grow um, really quickly. So I think that's, um, and I think APIs play a really crucial, and API management play a really crucial role in all of this, because they're they're the boundaries at which you can control uh, how data enters and leaves your organization, um, and, and that can help you to massively extend the surface of your organization. Uh, and I think that's how um, you can build um, affordance platforms that that can go beyond just having like a digital product. Uh, like, you know, yes, leadership will get excited about earning money through digital products, but I think the real game, the real price is to transform your business so that it can become uh, like a, a digital native business that, that has this, this, uh, this thing going for it. And um, that's, uh, that's it. Um, now, I, 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 I realize that this is going a bit into um, quite some philosophy and, um, I, so I'm really curious to hear what you're what you're thinking about all these things. Are there any questions or any remarks? Perhaps Christoph, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have one question from an architecture standpoint. How do, how do you see Dev Portal? Uh, being interacting or uh, uh, integrated with uh, uh, gateways and especially in a large company where you have uh, an heterogeneous landscape? Mm -hmm. So um, our main partner today is, um, is Google. So we, we work a lot with, with Apogee uh, and that's, uh, that's where we have the deepest integration for, for our dev portal. Um, but we can have multiple dev, like we can integrate with multiple gateways in our dev portal. Um, uh, so we, we are having now a pilot project with one customer where I think there they have three gateways that they want to be able to uh, provide API keys for. Um, so there's, there's um, I think for the sake of discoverability and findability, I think you should have, at least internally, for your internal audience, if, that, if that's what we're talking about, you should have one dev portal with all your services, no matter what gateway they're from. Like if you have to start segmenting by gateway, that's really bad. Um, in the best case, you have one gateway probably, although that I know that for some organizations, strategically that doesn't work because they don't want to have all their eggs in one basket. Um, or, you know, as you said, like a heterogeneous landscape with different branches that did different procurements with different technologies. Um, so that's why, um, you know, having one portal that can deal with that um, uh, is, is, I think, very valuable. And, and the way that we do that uh, in, in Drupal CMS uh, is we, we have a CI CD pipeline that's a gateway independent that you can push your API specification through and your documentation. Uh, and then we, you know, we have to set up some sort of integration so that we can provision API keys or, or maybe that's happening somewhere else. Does that answer your question, Jerome? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, other questions?
perhaps I have another one. So you, you mentioned you are working with uh, uh, with Google with the PG. Um, what's your what's your view on uh, using uh, uh, native portal from the API management vendors rather than uh, building uh, your own one? So. Um, I've seen people build their own. Um, it depends how, yeah, this is the build or buy decision, right? Um, I think there's a level of maturity that you can get from, from a productized API gate, or this was about gateways, right? Not about their ports. Uh, no, about portals, ah, okay, so, the problem I see with most gateways is that their their dev portal is very weak. Um, I've I've heard several stories, like a lot of stories from customers, where um, they've bought into a solution, uh, like in some cases where uh, you know the portal is part of the premium version, and then um, I'm thinking about one open source gateway, <laughs> and then you're you're Kind of pushed in this direction but the, the capabilities of this portal is just not that great um, because uh, this is another presentation that i did um, or another webinar we did a, a couple of a month or a few months ago about different forms of complexity that you need to address in a portal and depending on your organization um, that might be a lot of complexity and it's just really hard to build a product that can address all of those complexities so uh, that's why I really like the, the approach that uh, Apogee has taken to the, to the dev portal where you have um, an open source CMS that's really a pure play CMS like Drupal. That allow, uh, like it's, Drupal is a framework to build your own uh, CMS basically. Um, that allows you to, um, to adjust to whatever circumstances you need to adjust. You need multilingual documentation, sure, no problem. You need... Um, role-based access control and group-based access control, sure, no problem. Uh, you need uh, accessibility, uh, you need um, search engine optimization, all of these things are already there because it's a mature CMS that's been, been used by marketing for, you know, for, for almost a decade and a half. Um, well, let's say like a, a good decade has been used really intensively by, by really large organizations. So replicating all of that functionality either in, in um, uh, a bespoke, like a product, like a small scale product that doesn't have this, um, yeah, composability with uh, a code from the community, um, or in uh, a custom bespoke dev portal is going to cost a lot of effort. So I, I see, if you, I see, like, I see some digital natives build their own dev portal, from scratch, and, and and I see them be successful with that. Um, but then they have like a team of 10, 10 people or something, like five to 10 people just working on the developer portal nonstop. Um, and, uh, you know, and just having enough people for technology plus then all the people for, for the content as well. And that, that's just, that's an investment that most organizations don't really want to afford. Um, and um, yeah, the other thing that I've seen is organizations that start with, well, you know, we're developers, this is just a website, right? So we can do this, this is not hard. We'll take some React, we'll take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So they start building, they get a lot of initial velocity. Um, they build um, like using a static site generator or something. And then, uh, and then the business comes with, oh, actually, uh, we have, yeah, we have the special case where we need this group of people to only have access to these APIs, and then that group of people only access to those APIs, and and then suddenly, you know, it, it becomes really hard to fulfill those requirements. So then it's, um, and if you're then maintaining that on your own, uh, that that can be quite expensive. So what we try to do uh, with with our uh, productized uh, Drupal-based portal is to, um, uh, to accelerate development and to allow for uh, teams to reuse each other's code. 
So we can have um, multiple teams um, uh, that are getting similar functionality from a shared code base uh, that we're maintaining for them. So that's our answer to that. Thank you, everyone, for joining and for the feedback. And um, yeah, keep, keep in touch. Uh, if you're not on the newsletter yet, uh, definitely subscribe so we can, we can uh, uh, send you the, um, the recording and, and other things in the future.